Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. We're going to be taking a look at uh, part two of John Burns' bootleg outlaw fanboy. <laughs> what would you call this thing? All of that. It's so great. <laughs> I was waiting for more words to come out, Ed. But yes, all those things and more. The X-Men comic that he that he made just because he kind of felt like it. What, what to do when he retires, I guess. <laughs> First off, man, a little business ahead of time. We have, we're comic makers ourselves, man. Jim Rugg has the Plain Janes out there in the wild, as well as uh, Street Angel comics that are on Amazon and uh, elsewhere. Describe this book real quick, Jimmy. Bunch of high school artists get bored in their little suburban town, start doing public art, and just chaos ensues. Local law enforcement, parents, teachers, uh, fellow students. It just brings uh, kind of everything to a head, it stirs up trouble, and, uh, you know, perfect for the young adult reader out there, perfect for the young adult artist out there. Um, Kind of a, a tour de force of, uh, I don't know, what a lot of us can probably identify with going through high school art classes. We're makers, man. you got a Patreon. Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg, where you got a bunch of uh, process stuff, tons of PDFs, all kinds of uh, behind-the-scenes artwork and comics. I have Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor, where I'm serializing my Red Room comics. Antisocial Network is on the stands right now. I love the juxtaposition between both of our comics. And uh, this is going quick in the store, so if you see it, get it. Uh, Red Room Trigger Warnings, issue number one, uh, coming out in December. X-Men Elsewhen. We did this book some time ago, the first volume. Uh, if we got something like 20,000 views, we'll do the next one. I'm excited to jump back into this thing. Yeah, it was a popular video. We got this 20,000. This is a little overdue, but better late than never. Yeah, you know something else that's overdue, man? I feel like we should have 100,000 subscribers, man. And when we do... That's when I'm going to get real serious about thinking about uh, that cartoonist kayfabe comic convention, man. So hit that like and subscribe button if you if you watch this channel regularly, man. If you get value out of it on the daily or even uh, semi-weekly. If you want something right, Jimmy, you got to do it yourself, man. That is very true. So uh, here's let's just go into it real quick. Like what, what we're looking at here, man. Essentially, John Byrne has publicly stated lots of times, man, that no more work for hire. Uh, but he started to have talks with Marvel about doing X-Men comics, which made me curious. Like, uh, do you think that uh, they're going to sign contracts with you that are not work for hire uh, to do to do X-Men comics? Like, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what his train of thought was with that. But mad respect for just not worrying about uh, contractual stuff. Uh, this guy's a this guy's a comic book maker to his core. Uh, I don't know if you've ever worked for uh, the big two in this capacity, Jimmy, but sitting there waiting for the contract to get signed, you're just waiting for that starting pistol to go so you could run. Byrne just sat down and started making a comic and through inertia, never stopped. Yeah, it's a fascinating story. And, and him giving up on, uh, cr on uh, work for higher comics, I mean, he did work for higher comics for, what, 35 years or something? Like, he certainly put his time in. And it feels like this is, uh, you know, you reach a point, hopefully everybody reaches this point where you can do whatever you want in life. You right. know, you're, you're comfortably retired. And that's how I sort of picture John Byrne here. Subject matter-wise, though, for anybody that didn't see the first volume or is new to this... It's essentially, he's kind of picking up where he left X-Men. Whenever he leaves X-Men, it's sort of around, if, if, if X-Men had gone with him instead of Chris Claremont, this might be the uh, the direction, some of the storylines that we would have seen. And specifically, the takeoff is uh, from the original ending that uh, Chris Claremont and John, John Byrne put together before Jim Shooter came in and said, no, you have to kill Phoenix, man. She destroyed a whole planet's worth of, of people. Uh, she can't just get a slap on the wrist for that. And uh, we had that series end you know that storyline end with the death of uh gene gray even though she appeared in every issue <laughs> afterward <laughs> right. in some kind of wasn't life. dead for long yeah in some kind of dream state or something uh did you say fan fiction on your list of words for this because that's that's uh certainly where i would where i would classify it you know based on that little intro there yeah sure um, because that's what it is you know it's a an alternative timeline or an alternative storyline that is not uh editorially regulated so these these little volumes man they just fell off a truck. Exactly. And and they ended up at the kayfabe house. Uh, I think he's done at least 18 issues. And each of these contains six issues of comic. So what I'm saying is, if that third volume falls off a truck and comes our way, we'll be happy to receive it. <laughs> I agree with that, too. Each of these has six issues. Uh, and when you... When you Check out volume one. I was very excited by, by the reading experience of it. It's clear to me that... Burn is shot out of the cannon and has a lot of ideas that he wanted to expand on, like right after uh, that 
that fateful Jean Grey Phoenix sentence uh, occurred in X Men One Forty Two or whatever that was. Uh, when we get to this volume, the tone is way different. Uh, there's he's been slowly like setting up this fight between you know Mach Four Sentinels and and the X Men for uh, you know throughout he's peppered it out peppered it throughout the first volume. And now uh, we're in the sh the schmas, man. We're in the fight, and uh, it goes across about four issues. It's, pr it's pretty thin as a reading experience. Yeah, uh, I want to just mention burnrobotics.com before we dive into the content yeah, here, do it. where people can uh, can find this content online. Yeah, and I don't know if he's still actively making these or not, but you can find these pages on burnrobotics.com. And uh, it's interesting, people will go in and like ink and color these pages and stuff. So kind of fun in that side, keeping with the whole fan fiction thing. I'm sure everybody gets a hoot inking over Burn. I look at these pages and think they look beautiful to ink. So I understand that impulse. Um, but burnrobotics.com is sort of the origins for this. If, uh, if you want to check it out online or keep up with the latest of these comics. Um, but yeah, Ed, to your point about the storyline, and in in, I don't know if thin is the right word, but there's no, there are no subplots going on, you know, like it is just action, 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 action. And it does have the effect of like, all right, I don't know if I need four issues of just fighting, you know, almost invincible sentinels. Like I get it. They're hard to beat. Do it in, you know, eight pages instead of 80. That was the cool thing about that first volume. Like the stuff that we got in there, we had Savage Land stories, new mutants are being discovered. Uh, there's a Magneto fight. There's, there's, I think three or four different stories in the first six issues where there might, you know, it might extend to like one other issue. Uh, now, you know, he's, he's, he's spreading these stories thin over a, a bunch of issues. Uh, all of that said, man, if we would just want to talk the craft of, of drawing while looking through this thing, uh, beyond instructive, like as I was looking at these pages, uh, it directly informed the work that, that I'm working on at this very minute, um, specifically with rooting these characters in, a, in an environment by by uh, kind of gritting off your panel, like your perspectives from the start. I, I started to develop a system for myself to, uh, to compose my shots uh, a little bit better, and it came directly from reading this and seeing kind of trying to reverse engineer what I think he's doing by, by gritting off every perspective area. And he's doing it with these guidelines that are about say half inch to to a quarter inch spaced out yeah i'm trying to think where like like it shows up on this one they're just these faint lines um not sure if it's showing up on screen or not but some but will show there'll, there'll be some that are uh yeah that are a little bit darker but you know the flip side is like these are very dense you know the other thing that made it a little bit hard for me to read is there are a couple of arenas where the battles are taking place with large cast of characters. The Avengers are here. Fantastic Four is here. Some great sequences of, like, Fantastic Four and X-Men. And, like, you know, if you're a Byrne fan, probably his number one and two most beloved runs uh, between those two sets of characters. So it's really neat, the stuff he's bringing in. But a lot happens. Like, you can see the amount of word balloons minus color and ink. It can be a little bit much to be keeping up with where we're at, which cast of characters. I mean, there's got to be 30 characters or something that we see, uh, you know, Marvel heroes, which is kind of great and a lot of fun, but pretty dense, uh, especially in this form. What a great panel this is, man. That's amazing. This whole page is awesome, man. This is uh, hot off the heels of their fight with Magneto, outer space. They got to bring this clunker back to Earth if there's any chance of them surviving and formally playing with the panel designs to really sell you on that speed coming down toward uh toward earth man yeah a lot of weird shapes you see like their shuttle pulls out at the last second and the panel shape is like you know i don't even know oklahoma or something on its side <laughs> <laughs> but it works for what's going on in the panel it works really well i love i love the uh the panel designs on on uh pretty much every single page he is not abiding by the grid and he's have he has these overlapping panels nine times out of ten easily readable in terms of flow there's one or two where it starts to get kind of crazy but even if it was even if you had an editor the editor wouldn't say anything yeah i don't think you'd be pointing that out because it'd be hard for an editor who focuses on writing to uh really be able to say much or to to uh offer a solution or a way to fix this easily but it's it's instructive to see his pencils because he does so much of these kinds of different backgrounds yeah and there'll be shortcuts in there they look good but I think if you're really looking at this with an eye of like making comics, 
um, there's some tips and stuff, you know, like, like a silhouette shape of a house. This is a rectangle. Like there's, there's nothing too complex there, but it looks great on the page. Like yeah. it's, it sets your, your scene. The grids, I'm going to go back to those grids, man, where they're like fairly spaced out, uh, guidelines. Uh, I'm comparing that with the Art Adams grids that are super tight and close together to the point where you can't even tell which vanishing point this line is going to, where that line is going to. And having these spaced out grid lines, you know, he's kayfabe in the, the lines in between uh, whenever they're going to the vanishing point. And what that what that allows for is uh, taking your damn, taking the tape off your page uh, and just being able to freely move it a little bit, man. It also allows you to have a world that looks a little bit more like a world where like, yeah, it all is going loosely to the same vanishing point, but it's not that thing where it's like, a straight edge on every line yeah. that can be, uh, you know, it can, it can look a little out of place that way. Here's a pretty good example of some of those, uh, some of those grid lines there for that neighborhood. And, you know, you can see these, if you look closely, some of these houses that aren't on an actual line, but is kind of using that line as their guide. It's a good way to, I think, you know, quickly get a believable perspective, but also don't be dogmatic about it. Right. His um, effect uh, drawings in terms of like smoke, energy, lasers, debris, all of that stuff is beautiful to see in, in pencil because it's still, uh, more often than not, it's still a pencil line that's, that's meant for black and white, black and white line reproduction. So, uh, these little ticks are things that I've put in, into my toolkit, or at least am trying to, because smoke like this, not easy. Right. Energy blasts and stuff. Not so simple. He's also good with, uh, there was a panel a, a minute ago where there were three characters and they all had very different textured hair. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those, you know, like all these little things you don't think about when you're trying to figure out how to make comics, but a good comic artist does have those things in their tool shed and, uh, and you'll see them because it's in pencil form. Like it feels like put this on your how-to shelf of books. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of instruction on these pages. Absolutely, man. The, uh, the way he builds his figures too uh, is really instructive like you can see the kind of dominant shapes that go into like his trunk and his torso his work has always been that way you could you could always like if you practice copying some of his bodies and stuff you could see exactly how he's come up with like the exact kind of cylinders and rectangles to to build these figures and manipulate them in, in any way he he wants and that's essential if you're going to be a guy doing three team books a month Unbelievable. you better figure out uh, some shorthand to draw these figures it also reminds me of like movies when you'll see like a car or something from a movie and the lights aren't on it and the special effects aren't on it and it kind of looks like that's really simple or junky or whatever or different than it looks on the screen some of his pencils have that effect where it's like you can imagine once you ink over those figures and you add some kind of sky gradient behind it they come to life but when you look at them here they're the simplest shapes yeah so the big reveal for the Sentinels is uh, Sebastian Shaw is, is, has gotten hold of them and is, is kind of controlling them and running them. Yeah, you know, this whole storyline here, and, and, you know, we're going to probably focus on art more than, than anything uh, with this. This whole storyline here is actually this kind of the same storyline of the uh, Neil Adams, Roy Thomas issues where that, um, where, where, where that Trask guy turns out to be like a latent mutant and, and gets killed. Do you think that's intentional? And I say that because the layouts remind me of Neil Adams. You oh, know, like when you see these kinds of panel layouts, um, whenever the, the ship was crashing and there were all the verticals, it reminds me a lot of the Neil Adams X-Men layouts visually. You know, uh, Burn comes from a fan place, so that wouldn't surprise me at all. Uh, but it's it's that thing of playing the hits, uh, as as we say, right? Because that happens in that Neil Adams, but it also happened in that very first like Jack Kirby story where the creator of the uh, the Sentinels gets dispatched. I think on like live TV. So uh, he, you know, he's just more of the same. Yeah, it's extremely cartoonish. Even down to the point that this is structured as like 22 page uh, installments, you know, like it's, it's like fan. six issues, even though it's never, I don't think there's ever any plans to print it like, like an issue. And I don't know what his release schedule is, but I think for a while he was posting pages like three days a week or something. So it's not like once a month you get a new issue. Some interesting drawing on that Colossus. 
like the big whenever you're going in with a little more detail because it's full size. Yeah. Some uh, some interesting choices. And that's one of those where, you know, the, the pencils are just going to look different than if that were inked and colored. You yeah. Know, that's where a lot of that metallic really shows. You can see kind of the diagram for it here, but it's a long way from that final effect. Yeah, like what would you do if you were delivered this as an anchor with this hatching? Because that, that, that hatching uh, reads as organic material yes. to me. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, some of this stuff looks like it'd be an inker's dream, and some of it, it would be the inker trying to figure out some stuff. And you, you've seen enough John Byrne textures to see how he, how he would approach that himself when he's doing his debris and... And things like that, man. Doing shit like this, man, this, this like, janked up house, mm -hmm. that's not really that easy. It's to, very hard to, for me. To have that kind of chaos, man. But he's, like, effortless with it. It looks I so good. I think that's something that you had to figure out if you were a superhero artist, totally. like, early on. Totally. Uh, because it does look effortless. You know, even the next panel, when they're walking through it from a high shot, same deal. That would take me forever to make it look even halfway decent. And it just seems like it's almost a stamp that he puts on there. <laughs> right. <clears throat> Then we can start getting into things like we just saw those like those earlier like Sentinel designs like these these costume things, but then you get like Avengers Quinjets and looks nice technology. There. Good luck trying to draw this on your own, man. Like and he and he's freaking badass about yeah, it. Yeah, he's twisting it. Yeah, looks awesome. And you see inside the cockpit three or four of the Avengers there very clearly. He's a fucking great drawer with a, man. with a few Avengers flying alongside. That's a nice panel. He's a great drawer. There is no denying, man. I don't know if we saw it earlier. I think we probably did, but uh, I always like when uh, when uh, Beast has to pop on his his spectacles to to like <laughs> read read an instruction manual or something. It's hilarious the little details that uh, <laughs> become like the character moments in a, in a superhero comic. Yeah, and this reminds me so much of the how to draw comics the Marvel way. The dynamic figures, you know, lunging forward, foreshortening and stuff. That's when I started thinking about this is like, put it on your shelf with those tutorial books because uh, it, it's right in place with that stuff. He kayfabes back muscles with the best of them. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. like you, got, you got your like three main shapes. You got your lats, you got your uh, b shoulder blades, uh, you got that sort of middle piece, and then you just, you just got to sell the form. You just got to, the, the mashed potatoes that are underneath that skin... Just make sure, you know, it's it's all it's all uh, going with the contour. Yeah, it looks good. He does that so so often too. That's another one I think is tough for artists because, like, if you're a fan, you're not drawing the back of these characters when you're doing your pinups and, as a and kid, imaginary covers. As a kid, that was like the toughest thing. The 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 part where that's like where your arm covers when when your your arms are down. That side view of the trunk, like. What fits into where? Like, how does any of that work? Because your action figures don't even sell that properly. So you have, like, no reference for that stuff. There would be these weird things with the scans. We'll see this often where there's this, like, extra weird kind of gray. Mm -hmm. And there's, like, a darker pencil. Line. I have no idea what that stuff is, man. Yeah, I think that's just a shadow. I, you know, it's got to be just artist interpretation when he's putting in his lettering and going, you know, I need this shadow to, to pop a little bit. I see. I assume. I mean, because that's usually whenever it happens. It is, yeah. Creating some kind of a value that's not black, but it's definitely darker than the rest. He's building some kind of gimmick where, where Jean Grey has, uh, like, Kitty Pride type powers, and we're going to see a lot of that often. But just showing the, the power is always uh, a thrill to see. Just as a viewer, man. These also, kind of that moments. kind of uh, frozen in time where she's obviously falling, but we're not getting her on the ground. We're getting her in that spot where, like, she's going down. I always think that's fun for balance and movement. You know, anytime you have a character falling, it's the moment of, like, clearly they're past whatever the tipping point is. Right. He really has internalized that how to draw comics a Marvel way kind of dynamic it feels Style. like it, man. Page after page. The Iron Man really feels like the Iron Man from How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way. Yeah. And, you know, I mentioned Fantastic Four and X-Men. If you wanted to add another book that he's got some time on, it's Avengers. Totally. So it's I mean, kind of yeah. like, yeah, this is just all the hits. He's putting all of his, his, his joints in here, man. This is the best, too, whenever it's like Iron Man flying through a, a suburban home, a living room. <laughs> and uh, try as you may, man. Nobody can make Wonder Man look cool. No. That feels like a total uh, a Neil Adams, right? It was, and me, a little a little nod to himself as well. But. Yeah, for sure. That the panel with the Sentinels like 
crushing Wolverine. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty brutal. <laughs> yeah, I love it too. It's such a Marvel uh, dialogue. Thing can't break my adamantium bones, but it still hurts. <laughs> <laughs> when, we, when we start to see these kinds of pieces of architecture, this is really where you see how that grid that he draws underneath sings. Because what I imagine he does is blocks out very quickly like what he wants where and then he and then he creates his vanishing point setups from there and then just goes in with the pencil man maybe has like one of those like little little gimmick uh rulers and just draws everything in but he's not precious like you said with the vanishing point and it allows him room to kind of move around you know i used to be so rigid with that like taping things down and getting everything to to hit that vanishing point and it just, it, it looks good. Look how the, uh, this grid continues on into this next panel that's completely unrelated. It's, it's kind of an unusual set of tangents because it's just following this, this perspective grid. Yeah. Except here it's not perspective, it's not being used exactly as perspective grid, at least not the same way. This makes me think of the stories you'd hear of Terry Austin making sense of, say, his background doodles in the first X-Men run because even though, like, your, your structure is here, if you look at the little cars and details and things, it's very loosely put in there. Yeah. You know, if, if this was going to be published, an inker would have to go in there and sort of like strengthen those lines, put in your window panes and things like that. Uh, so kind of, kind of neat to see that too. Like how much info do you need? It's more than a layout, but it's also not like the Jim Lee, I've hatched in every single line and pencil, now trace it. All right. Oh, look at this janky Wolverine that just got burnt and stepped on. <laughs> and then... Uh, you're all right. Your healing factor. He's like, it ain't instantaneous, babe. It's gonna... No, he looks mangled, man. That's a, that's a good one. It's going to sting for a little bit. I hate some of these lettering boxes. They're all these weird shapes. Like, he just outlined them with whatever the words kind of indicated the shape that's necessary. Right. I find them distracting, especially whenever you get into pages with, you know, five or six of these balloons next to each other, or boxes next to each other. Yeah, yeah, I do wonder. It's like, well, like, what, what is that? Is that just trying to be interesting? Is it uh, you so happy with your drawing that you don't want to cover it up? Like, what yeah, exactly know. are we doing there? It, it just feels a little bit unconsidered to me, you know, because some of it is like a vertical line on the edge, and now we have an angle line in the same same panel and what looks like the same kind of lettering treatment, right? But completely different lines that look like they should be. I mean, shouldn't that be horizontal? But it's it's slightly not horizontal. Yeah, it calls attention to itself, right? And that's that's one of the tenets of good lettering. Like, uh, don't do that. Yeah, and some of the outlines are like different line weights. Some are dotted lines, you know, like there's a dotted line on two sides of that box. I just don't get it. All I right. don't know. It seems weird to me. Yeah. Here's the plot twist of uh, Elsewhen, man. The, uh, the Phoenix is still out there, and it's going to take over Lalandra. Yeah, that's one of those things where you're cutting back and forth to like Shire Empire and, and Deep Space, but not a lot of like establishing shots. It's just like, nope, we just got a page there. And now we're back in wherever the hell the last fight was going on. Right. And it doesn't help that there's a couple of Sentinel fights happening simultaneously, like Indiana and I think outside New York. There's this part here, like in, in this in this issue, when they start fighting these Sentinels a little bit closer, that's what these outfits are, uh, where it's revealed... Basically, I think a, an editor would have uh, helped them like got, uh, fix some word choices and stuff because they kind of give up the ghost real early that their friends are inside these skeletons. And it's like you just actually don't have to do that because the next issue, like, it pays off. Like, we see the reveal. It, it would make the reveal much more substantial. And you don't even, you don't even see that our guys are in there. Uh, it's just... In, through dialogue, like, hey, I think Nightcrawler's in there. Uh, so, you know, eventually we, we see them in there, that, and that's a big reveal. But uh, I, it was John Byrne. He was on this, like, sci-fi channel thing or something, and he's talking and said something like, you know, I've often made the mistake that my readers were as smart as me. So <laughs> so that's, like, one of those examples <laughs> where uh, he, he's just... Uh, that's such a John Byrne thing to say. Yeah, he's just uh, hey, letting the reader know. There's a there's a perspective grid on this panel, and I'm looking at it, and I don't know that you need it there. There's nothing real tight there. I mean, obviously figures appear in perspective too. Yeah. But there's not a lot of straight edges, and I'm surprised to see it there because it looks like there are 
three it's like three point perspective there's yeah. a lot going on in that panel and I, I don't i don't know enough about three point perspective and how you would apply it to those three figures and the way they're drawn there oh man dude like i mean you see this guy up in the air and then it's like it's probably for the shapes of the cylinders like Maybe. make sure the lines are going the same way that's the thing that i was making note of and the things that i was paying attention it all for reads myself right you know i mean that's a good looking panel i'm not criticizing anything that's in the panel but I wouldn't have expected to see three-point perspective grid on that panel. Yeah, like he's... Uh, it probably is revealing. Like, this, I probably should know that. This is the kind... Of, I mean, this is exactly the kind of stuff that, I'm, that I've am that i been uh, paying a lot of attention to in my, in my own work for, for these reasons. Because I've been... My, my favorite cartoonists totally fake that stuff. Like, Robert Crumb fakes that kind of thing when there's a foreground figure, middle ground figure, background figure, and, like... There's it's just this floating idea of perspective or something, but uh, I've been also looking at you know an anime good manga. Um, they're not faking it, you know they they don't and and it looks better when it's not faked in a lot of ways. Like this looks good, good facial expressions on Kitty Pride here. A little jealous. There's a new mutant in town, <laughs> and she's a badass. <laughs> Yeah, so like even like having the uh, perspective grids here, like you do have this house, but you got this flak jacket on uh, this this copper right here, man, and the vanishing point is low, so you got to make sure all those all those lines go go kind of like on the right contour, go in the right direction. It's fun to see glimpses of other artists too. Like I'll see bits of Jim Lee now and then pop in. And I assume Jim Lee was influenced by Byrne, oh, you know, big, big, big X-Men artist taking over after a big X-Men artist. Like, got to be looking at him. But to me, there's some Jim Lee's isms in this figure, which is kind of cool to see and, uh, and imagine that lineage. There it is, man. We took a look on uh, the Kayfabe channel at some early John Byrne submissions, and he chose to do a Fantastic Four bunch of pages, like a whole issue of uh, Fantastic Four type comics and pencil. You can find that video on the channel. And he was doing Fantastic Four when I was like when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah, I've I've picked up some of those Fantastic Four. Good good five year run on Fantastic Four. Interesting to see him doing the thing. I have trouble drawing the thing. Yeah, yeah, you could really get like if you have like any kind of compulsion or OCD, you could really uh, overdo it. Thing's one of those guys with the figure too that is not the human figure, right? Which always is is uh, challenging. Man, a lot of perspective grids on that right-hand page there at oh, the yeah. bottom. Oh, yeah. It's so chaotic. It's, it's hard for me to even believe how those all work together. He's got that giant drafting board, too. So so he's setting, setting that vanishing point off far, far away. See, here's the reveal where uh, Sebastian Shaw has, has all these mutants in his clutches to to sort of, like, use their powers for uh, the Sentinels or however that works. One of them's Blob, and it's funny to think of how Blob fits inside of a Sentinel and, like, what's his power? Right. <laughs> the immovable object. The Sentinel just sits there. <laughs> That's also in the new Adams run. And I think it's I think it's actually a lot of the same freaking mutants that get captured. How about this helicopter, dude? That's sick, man. Yeah, got to be the morgue file, right? Got to be. And he ain't tracing a, a helicopter. Like, this is, you know, a kayfabe comic book helicopter that looks totally believable. The smoke getting blown out where you could see a little bit of the houses and neighborhood underneath. Like, this is a good page of story. I mean, a good panel of storytelling right there. I don't know helicopters well enough. Like, it does look like the tail might be a little bit short, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. But it's so well, like, this part looks so confident. Like, that reads totally accurate to me. Right. You know, if you told me it was traced, I'd be like, sure, it looks looks like it. Also, it's interesting how much the helicopter resembles this new Sentinel model. Sure. Aerodynamic, sleek. After reading, like, that top tips from cartoonists and every guy just emphasizing having a, a morgue file, it makes me wonder, like, Burns old school, like, what kind of, you know, when he creates a new Sentinel... What's informing that stuff? And then you see a helicopter, and it's like, wow, those look real similar. You uh, do you have your morgue file of like, 
you know, tech and machines and things to reference to put together a new design. Oh, I'm sure he does, man. Put built that stuff over 50 years. Also looks like a little anime manga influence, it does. which probably would make him pissed off if he heard us say that. Yeah. <laughs> You point to that, man, and I'll point to this translucent That's the money. That's uh, good stuff. Cyclops right here. Seeing seeing them pull this kind of shit off in pencil is really awesome. What's nuts about it is you get you don't get to render to make your your arms or hide a mistake. Like it's one line to delineate that arm or or his figure, his head, his twist, anything, yeah. and it all adds up there. Obviously, a guy who's got his uh, wonder how many hours he has is like a penciler. You know what I mean? Is he 200,000 hours in? Yeah, good call, man. Like, <laughs> he's been in the game a hot minute. Turned out a lot of pages. This Nightcrawler is vaguely disturbing to me. Yeah, it doesn't seem quite right. That head looks a little bit big. And Maybe just, not, but just, it, it looks a little big. Just all the gimmicks, like, connected to him and just how bound up he is. Helpless. And there's a piece of dialogue in here that's really good whenever uh, whenever all the friends get saved from, from the Sentinel thing, where... Uh, they mentioned something about like these they they lost a lot of weight they're emaciated whoever had them gave no thought to their health or well-being it's good hey this is awesome across three panels this is all the same sentinel and it goes from being solid to like the transparent you know mix and then totally the inside part but it's one big long wide shot yeah. that's a great three panel sequence yeah it's super sick man and it's it's that thing that we've seen uh Masamuni Shiro do it in Appleseed, where we got to sell the guy on the inside. How do you do that? Here's a pretty effective way. Yeah, I like that a lot. It'll be helped out a lot with color mm -hmm. uh, when this, you know, this thing would be inked and put together. So we've been building for four, like probably even more issues, like if we count the ones in here with these new Sentinels and stuff. And this is your, this is the death of Sebastian Shaw right here. He just gets squeezed real quick because it turns out that uh, you know he's a mutant. And the Master Mold is detecting him. It's been done three times before this. It's a surprise for a f relatively big character to be dispatched in a relatively small panel. Exactly. Very quickly. Exactly. That's <laughs> what I'm saying, man. I mean, we've been building up. There's no, there's no O. Henry to it. Like, there's no big fight where the guys have to interact with Sebastian Shaw. It's just like, nah, you're toast, dude. Yeah, panel one, the, the Sentinel realizes he's a mutant. Panel two, he kills him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And it's pretty uh, grueling, man. There's some stuff coming out of his mouth, man. Some schmutz. He's he's getting color. But here is where it, it, you get some drag from me. On the right side, it's like now the whole Sentinel army is coming out. And it's like we've just spent multiple issues establishing how impossible each of these Sentinels is to defeat. And now we're sending 127 of them, at least, at the X-Men. Right. Like, haven't we just seen the massive Sentinel battle for six issues? Right. <laughs> Here goes our beast with the, with the specs, man. It's funny, too, to go from, like, Wolverine to the beast. It's like, oh, he just cleaned up. He's going out tonight. <laughs> that is one of those storytelling things that you always got to be aware of. There's one of those shading uh, bits that you mentioned. You're really right, man. It's it's the fore it's separating the foreground, uh, middle ground, background stuff. Some indication, maybe, for the colorist. This is the master mold breaking out of that uh, Hellfire Club. That breakout building. scene's good. A lot of debris coming off of the building and then foreground figures and background figures. Yeah, with 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 full acting yeah. in these very small panels. Yeah, Makes like it... you're getting your foreground in those in those fleeing figures, your middle ground breaking out, and your background of the hero showing up. That's a heck of a panel. Yeah, it is. This book is full of that stuff. You know, this is like 101 superhero storytelling. I mean, it's, just, it's what he does, you know. Doing this kind of shit selling the strength of uh, Colossus with that. You see real good examples of that in, in, in manga and things, man, and that's a pretty good showing. He's always been good at that stuff. I think about, like, uh, Days of Future Past, whenever it's, like, Avalanche is fighting Colossus, and they're picking up the ground and using it as a whip and stuff like that. Like, just very imaginative. I wonder if color and ink sells that as being more epic. You know, with having the Avengers Fantastic Four, like, it, it is this gigantic fight. And, you know, we're getting it in the context of, like, volume two in the middle of the book. It looks like all the other pages. But it's like all the superheroes are, are, you know, fighting for their life. And I wonder if there's something that would make it feel bigger if it were finished. Yeah, yeah. I I wonder. But you know something? You bring up color. That's, that's something that, uh, like, when you're drawing these characters, I really 
don't feel like it's finished until they're in color. Like whenever I did that piece that I sent off that I tweeted and was like, Marvel should let me do my thing. As I was making that piece, it's the first time in my adult life I'm drawing any superheroes, you know, like it's, it, that's what got me interested in comics in the first place. And I was just like, one day, just like, let me just draw these guys, scan it in, start adding color. And with each figure, I'm like, oh shit, that's Wolverine now. Cause I put the, the yellow and blue outfit on him. Oh shit. This is, this really looks like Colossus, Colossus now. This really looks like Nightcrawler. So it's like these superhero comics are like unfinished until you see the blue and red on Spider-Man. Yeah. This is an incredible spread. Yeah. Every, you know, like there's so many good moments like across this spread. It's a great Phoenix, man. That Phoenix looks hard. Yeah, man. And, and we would see in the Terry Austin, John Byrne, X-Men, the inked version of this. So it's so cool to see it in pencil and to see the things that he's doing. What, what I'm thinking we're looking at here is the employment of that, that uh, electric eraser to draw, actually draw lines in by way of reduction. And you, have, you feel the gleam, you feel the brightness of the Phoenix right there. Yeah, that's a really interesting drawing. And I was thinking the same, I was wondering the same thing. I was like, how is he making the white marks on here? And it does look like they're a race and they're not like a Photoshop effect or anything. So you ever use one of those electric racers? I did. I, I have one, but my batteries ran out. I never replaced it, but I, I have played with them. And I also would use a, an eraser template. You ever see those things? Yeah. They're like a little stainless steel shield with lines or circles, different shapes. And then you can like erase the hell out of those little openings, almost like a stencil for erasing. But yeah, you know, those are pretty organic on this drawing. Like, I don't think that's what he's using here. I think it probably is an electric racer. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like, depending on the torque, you know, there, there are those like five dollar electric racers and they're like the fifty dollar ones this looks like the fifty dollar job you know back to what you're saying about color um interesting you know using black for your lettering there uh not exactly a color but if all you're doing is black and white it kind of is yeah um but you know you think of like how carefully composed all these panels are you know all these figures just really being placed specifically Color can change that a lot. You know, you put a blue Fantastic Four costume next to, you know, I don't know who, but it could look much different in color. Like, yeah. it could really play with your compositions, and, and I don't think that most of us that are penciling are thinking that way. Another great example of that energy, where he's employing that eraser to really sell you on the, the brightness of, of the figure. And when you see all this Phoenix stuff, you start to wonder, like, do 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 Claremont and Burn like is this like Phoenix their greatest invention or something like that? Because they they always keep going back to that well, man. It does feel like that's the big story for them, right? Yeah. So it kind of makes sense. I mean, hasn't Claremont talked about like a billion copies of that book or something in print? Like, well, you know, you know? like like this. I, I I was thinking about that stuff, man. Like in conversation with him, and and I do think he did say it publicly in, in his Columbus uh, Columbus. Columbia University. Yeah, that'd be it. Conversation. Uh, Seven hundred million copies of of uh, his his X Men comics in print. Uh, for an edition, sure, but it's not like Amer like we were constantly reprinting stuff before like eighty six or whenever those guys would not have been getting royalties. So, if we want to be conservative, man, and say that maybe fifty million. A hundred million of those things were in English in America after 86 or whenever they started doing royalties and Chris Claremont, John Byrne stuff is the prominent comics of that run. You get some nice royalty checks. Yeah, no doubt. Um, or excuse I me incentive checks. Gotcha. <laughs> I, I read Dark Phoenix in a trade paperback decade and a half before you know the graphic novel age yeah. so like before they were really doing a lot of collections that was one that was available plus classic x-men reprinted those things and i'm just sitting here in my head thinking like how many you know like i don't know that marvel looks at their books as perennials yeah but dark phoenix like how many versions of that have been printed and collected and reprinted and published over the years like there might be 20 editions of dark phoenix saga not to mention how many vol how many copies of each edition totally but you know it's been reprinted 
almost steadily since it, it was since it appeared. Sure, specifically, like my my train of thought is thinking about uh, how Chris Claremont and John Byrne could have prospered for that, like how they could, how John Byrne could have the time to do this and not worry about paying the bills, and it would be because of like the incentives received from the reprints that were after the the period where they started to uh, allow for royalty payments and stuff. How about that two-page spread, Jimmy? It's great. I was admiring like the marks on the thing, you know, the backside of the thing getting hit with an energy blast in the front. And I, I like seeing the different ways he uses pencil. You know, like when you yeah. put out those energy blasts or like a, like Phoenix being just these like one outline, um, it's great to see the pencil being used like a pencil. Right. Checking out like just these shapes, man, the black flag logo <laughs> for that hand. It's perfect. A lot of fun, fun pencil marks on that thing at the top. Oh, yeah. Putting that side of the pencil to use. Absolutely. He would do that uh, with with this, too. It looks like, man, just using like a dull pencil to sell you on that kind of uh, craggy mm -hmm. rock rock surface. And his ink line would like mimic that. So whatever tools he was using to uh, to ink, it wouldn't look dissimilar than that. He would go through phases where I think he would get criticized for his inking or his speed. And, and this is what made me think of that. Yeah. Because you know, it would be that rocky texture. Um, like Wonder Woman era, man, where yeah, it's just... I, some I, of the next men stuff. Looks like uh, Sharpie, even. This, uh, speaking about that, makes me think of his OMAC run. And that's that's a book I want to look at on here sometime. I, I was looking at it this week, and it's it has... All of his marks are there. You know, it's almost like the ink version of this, where you get to see, like, everything he's doing with, with black and white. But you definitely see some of those kinds of textures translated. I always like this kind of... Uh image with mm -hmm. like a dense cityscape because uh you could think of like otomo as well um the negative space really is just the white noise of the buildings so mm -hmm. so it's super detailed but it's actually the negative space of the composition if that makes sense yeah no straight lines because he doesn't always use them but here they're obviously ruled contrast to your figure, the organic lines on a figure in the foreground. I like this kind of thing because whenever I go to a city, I always am struck by like the scale is so different than what I see in comic books. Mm -hmm. Like it's hard to get that. And sometimes you'll get a shot like that that feels pretty good. Like that kind of feels like you might be on the street and, you know, that'd be what you would see or how, you know, your whole vision would be full of building. Yeah. Um, so I like it whenever you get a shot that's a little bit different like that and feels like, yeah, maybe that's that's reasonable. The other part of his uh, draftsmanship that seems very uh, strong is when we have to get these, like, ellipses in, into his imagery. These shapes would show up on some of those sentinels and uh, in a lot of places, man. And it always looks good. It always looks right. Yeah, that's amazing because that's like a wheel that leans in at the top. Yeah. Um, there's a couple shots of Xavier's wheelchair, and it's they're all impressive. I don't know if he's designing that so he takes extra pride in it or what, but it looks good. Going back to Amazing Fantasy 15 with that Spider-Man yeah. <laughs> right there. Look at that. Wow. <laughs> I missed that on the read through. <laughs> I love it. He had that run on Spider-Man of like, the Lost Chapter or Forgotten Years or some... I forget what it was because he did an X-Men that was yeah. similar. But it's like a 12 or 13 issue run on Spider-Man. It's kind of neat. And it's I, in that era whenever he's inking and going pretty fast. I pulled uh, issue one for us to go through at some point. These chaotic panel compositions, man, are like I'm I'm really digging these. Anything that goes against the standard grid has been sexy to me lately, and I've been making note a lot for my own purposes. That right page, there you go with your uh, your pencils and energy and all of those things. Yeah. Yeah. Especially like I love this where the trees are being like obliterated with the impact explosion. It's a good set of storytelling, man. Then you got your like little gross guy like emerging from the rubble. Like that's that's a nice page of storytelling. It feels like a throwback. You know, I feel like I've seen this in, in a dozen comics from my youth. Oh yeah. Maybe a page one or or an epilogue maybe <laughs> add added to the end and this is what's coming up next month. Mm hmm Still working on that damn Sentinel. Yeah, a lot of, like, back to New York City captions. Yeah. And the deus ex machina of uh, 
dispatching the Sentinels is underway. Uh, Reed Richards figured it out, and all the Sentinels dropping like flies. And the chaotic panels here work perfect for the storytelling because it's showing all around the world how uh, you know the Sentinels are are um, finished. They're dying, and you do the exact thing that you have to do uh, in comics when you're going all around the world, man. Clearly mm-hmm. in France, mm-hmm. you know, you're in some kind of Japanese kind of place. You got your your kind of African setup, your kind of Middle Eastern. Uh, I'm real ignorant because I don't know what that one right there is. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out, like, must be a Russia, right? We have Canada in the top left. You can also identify these by your heroes. Exactly. So Alpha Flight, that's Canada. <laughs> exactly. Sunfire, Jap- J- Japan. Doesn't quite look Kremlinish, but I'll, I'll go with you on that. I don't know. I, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure about it. I wouldn't swear to the Russian thing, but also no heroes in that one. All right. Because there are no heroes in Russia. Because this is a Cold War era story. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Got to remember that, man. This is uh, taking place in 82 or something. Robin Bougie makes an appearance. <laughs> I was wondering about who this guy is right here. Because, like, that, that looks... Is that John Byrne? I don't know, man. It's so funny. At that pencil stage, it's like maybe Walt Simonson. Right. <laughs> it's like a little dude with a beard. <laughs> How about the end of this issue, man? A bunch of dudes just shoot a lady in the chest. How good would that be in a real issue as your uh, cliffhanger page? Oh, yeah, man. You're coming back next month. There's some wonky drawing in that one. Look at that shoe. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> but uh, not the focus. Look at these central casting villains, too. Like, there's the bad guys hanging out at the bar. It's almost like this dude looks like he's cut out and pasted on there. It does. You know, the line weight's totally different than the picture under it. I'm almost sure those are drawn and put on top. All, all of those figures. Yeah, it looks like it, huh? Yeah, the pencil value's different than the uh, than the figure underneath, and it just looks like different line weight, like it's a smaller line. And you see this kind of halo of white around the figures, so there's there's something being done there, some 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 sort of shorthand, you know, some shortcut. I mean, and it's the kind of thing like I do this maybe say in Procreate, where it's real easy to be like, you know what, that sentinel ought to be bigger or smaller right. or whatever. You know, I, I like this part of the drawing, but let's zoom in a little bit. Um, it all it all go out in the wash with the ink, you know, like the ink would unify that one hundred percent. You'd have no knowledge of it. Yeah, yeah, that's a cool thing. Here goes some more of those crazy John Byrne textures that we've associated with his kind of later period. Yeah, anytime he's drawing vegetation, it is so dense. Yeah, kind of like looking at that. That's another one that you know, once you put ink on it, that's going to look a lot different. So so hard, man. It's so hard. Like he is great with vehicles. So we are talking about. Xavier's wheelchair and you get a snippet of it but anytime you see like the airplanes like that's a pretty wicked perspective to have to draw that jet and it looks good it look, all makes sense looks cool another one of those foreground shadow things a little to- toth nod right, with, the, <laughs> with the airplane wheel in the foreground <laughs> just fill it in black John it's funny Wolverine takes the uh, protects Cyclops here and I was thinking reading this like it's a big deal you know Cyclops is talking about well, he saved me and uh this was a time in X-Men where I guess those guys weren't too chummy. Right. Were they ever? Yeah, I don't know. I think eventually they earned each other's respect. Because they're all fighting over that redhead. That's right. The redhead with the five-year-old mind. <laughs> well, that's a John Byrne invention for this gimmick. <laughs> it's pretty neat that he, when he tries to draw that, you know, like, how do you represent that part? Like, make it clear that mentally she's on a different level than her physical appearance. I feel like that's a pretty good one with the eyes, big round eyes. Yeah, where you see uh, four sides of white, man. Crazy eyes. <laughs> More of that perspective grid, man. Like, like I, I adore, I, I really do feel like this is just like a new, a new piece to add to the toolbox when putting pages together. Because I see what he does with it, you know, like... He'll he'll lay that down. Maybe it's it's so faint. Maybe it maybe it's in like just a, a harder pencil so that the line shows up thinner or blue line or something. And it just gives you a map that you could just pop you could populate this little area with stuff. And it all is basically right. It looks good. I think he's drawing all this on paper, so that's real pencil. But that's one of those digital tools that exists now where it's like, man, you can just move your point for those grids, have three or four of the grids, whatever you want on there. And uh, I I never do that, and I should, because I do end up drawing a bunch in Procreate, 
and it's such a quick way to generate a perspective grid. Yeah, like I uh, what I what I'll do is I'll draw a figure and and then put it in there. But I think he does the faintest block of figures, and then does the perspective grid, and then goes in and draws. And and I think that series of steps is what I'm going to try to employ going forward, uh, rather than just like say draw like your Wolverine here and then figure out the perspectives after because your some of your contours to the figure should be informed by where the vanishing point is you know some of the roundness of like the pecs or something that is a really good panel for foreground background it is i i didn't even realize like whenever we're looking and just pointing at that grid background i was thinking it was two different panels ah. because he's so far in the foreground and it's another one that would be aided by your ink line could aid that color could aid that but to really just push that separation but um, I'm always impressed by these panels that are able to achieve that kind of uh, depth. These uh, these comics, they really do. When you read a gang of them together, it really is like reading Tintin or Little Orphan Annie, where like nobody gets a moment's rest. So like they just finished that big epic Sentinel battle. They got Jean Grey back at the crib and they're running some uh, some diagnostics on her, seeing what what's going on. And Wolverine, he's pining over her. But there's also the part like, see, this part is like could use some edit editorial uh stuff so he's leaving because jeans is girl you know he digs gene whatever but then he's like you know i'm having mixed feelings about genie because ever since i met mariko and it's like well why don't you just lean toward mariko then like <laughs> uh, clearly this chick is pining over cyclops you know let let the ginger go this is neat with the heavier line to show you like a foreground it's framing that running sequence. That would be like a piece that Toth would just make that all black. Mm -hmm. Just make that all black and frame your guy. Even make this one black too. Cause, yep. Because then you have a perfect frame for your dude. I and agree. it's a perfect separation. Because the alternative is whenever it's colored, you would do something to exactly. make that a separate layer. Yeah. You know, like, when you see this kind of graphomania, kind of profiling the the creator of something like this, I I wonder if he would think that that would be cheating. Hmm. Right? Yeah, like, I maybe. Mean, it, it's clear to you or me, clear to maybe some other people who are watching this stuff, but he did it. He did this for a reason. Hey, John, get in touch with us, man. Is Toth a cheater? <laughs> <laughs> and this is that little guy, man, uh, that is in that probably I think even that first issue of the John Byrne X-Men and and it was like they introduced this little little dude and he fucks Wolverine up real good and it's a big deal you know because he's so tiny and small even smaller than Wolverine but his little ass got burnt upon uh, entry into our atmosphere more of those kayfabe back muscles that look so perfect I really need to figure that out man it does feel like a trick. It does, yeah. And it's just like, like a shorthand, some sort of a shorthand. Round shapes. This and is a good, this is a nice, another one of those nice spreads. It is. The only part that I'm not sure of is here Wolverine's getting blasted and you see him like, you know, knock through the air and falling into the mansion. And I don't know how much that reads, you know, like it, it looks like flying Wolverine. You it know does. what I mean? It doesn't necessarily look like Wolverine knocked out, you know, being thrown through the air. Yeah. He, he'll have his like stock Superman poses that he'll like use a couple of times over and over again. Might have busted that out from the morgue. Yeah, it reminds me of Namor number one. There's some, some images that look quite a bit like that. These two panels, I, I freaking love these because one, all the claw marks, you know, like that, that arm is just flailing wildly, pretty awesome. And then here we're looking through, it's like Wolverine's point of view through the claws, right. uh, watching this fight unfold. Pretty good stuff. That is cool. It's hard to be inventive in a fight. You know, because I mean, seen a lot of them. Right? How many of how many fights is Burn drawn? So whatever you can find, like a new way to sh to show some of this stuff, I say uh, kudos to you. These poor gray parents, man. Yeah. They sh they just shouldn't even be indoors ever. There there there's several times whenever they're just like nothing to do with the X Men. They want out desperately, <laughs> and I understand. It's the one piece that I totally understand in this comic. Like, you cannot be insured. If the greys come into your house, man, like every insurance company would have a proviso, like we will cover things as long as the grey parents are not ever stepping foot inside of your domicile. 
Like, what did they do in their last life? The <laughs> karma that they're lugging around with them. Jeez. They're the opposite of long shot. Exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm confused right by that. Yeah. I don't know what's happening. It says uh, the, the previous caption is instinctively Peter Rasputin transforms to living metal. And then he screams because the result is agonizing. I, I don't get it. You, you know, I, I feel like something that could have helped this is if you just flip it 180 degrees where, where our guy's upside down. It would create just... I, he, I think they're just trying to create that disorientation of our little guy picking him up. So, like, flip him upside down and you'll just be kind of disoriented for a half a... Pa you know, for a panel, two seconds. And then you see that, you know, our little guy's picking him up. Hey, I would say erase the pan the caption that says the result is agonizing. I have no idea what's agonizing. Is it him turning into metal that he does every issue several times? Is yeah, it sure. a guy picking him up? Like, he's not being thrown yet. You yeah. know, like... I don't know. It's weird. It just doesn't... I don't understand it based on what I think is happening. Yeah, delete that sentence. You'll, you'll be fine. This is a cool little sequence, man, where, where Jean Grey is kind of seeing into what that little dude was witnessing up there in the Shi'ar galaxy. You don't see Byrne do too much stuff with, with panel formal stuff like this. Yeah, I was looking at it and thinking, like, how's he literally making this? Because the panel borders look drawn, but that inside, I'm sure, is just copied and repeated, like in Photoshop or something. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, y y you do wonder where his tricks are, right? Because, like, I mean, this is a trick. This is There's something happening here. Yeah, what the heck is that? Yeah, is it Gaussian blur or something? Swirl? He hit the swirl button? I'm thinking if he's, like, sampling uh, Spiral or... or uh... Uzumaki? All <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Little Junji Ito selling you on the gladiator being a little fucked up, man, by messing up his mohawk. Yeah, the, the, trying to separate him from Omac. <laughs> um, this is a fun gimmick, though. This is some sort of transport to get to Earth quicker. So he puts he puts the dude in in this shell and he's gonna throw him through it. <laughs> kind of like that. Yeah, yeah, because the little guy is uh, conceptually should be indestructible. Never really been put to the test. But let's see what happens. So here's the before shot. And then when he comes out, man, looking like a Slim Jim. Look at this poor bastard. <laughs> hey, here's a question for you. Le uh, right eye, right eye. Why wouldn't you do a left eye on uh, on that panel? You know, like complete the face sort of. You know what I mean? Or or do, uh, you know, do the left eye of him so that it's the opposite halves of the faces. But That'd probably be the way to go. In one, a way. one or the other, something. It's weird that they're both just the same uh, same side. And here comes that Phoenix gimmick again call back to that fateful issue where Jim Shooter interfered. Like, see, this is how it ended, man. Uh, this is, these are the set of pages that Shooter was like, now nah, you got to redo that. That caption is uh, barely one swift year ago. Um, this is 12 issues. Like, it really is kind of built as if this would have been the continuation of the story. Yeah, you know, like, I'm glad you said that because, like, there's a part here where... Um, when Jean Grey is in the middle of nowhere at that bar with those weird dudes. And it said uh, she ran away from home six hours ago. Mm. Barely six hours ago, she was safe in her parents' home. That was issue, like, three of this. <laughs> well, you know comic book time. <laughs> I'm saying that's, like, beyond comic book time, man. You know, is he trying to do 24 in, in comic book form or something? 24 issues is one day. In uh, the life of the X-Men. It's a lot of action to cram in. <laughs> Big day. So we've seen him do all this terrestrial, earthly architecture and stuff. Now he's going sci-fi. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy, it's so good, man. It is good. Really shows his range off nice. It's unbelievable. I wonder if he's even faster at this stuff. I bet, Because right? there's nothing that he's got to reference. It doesn't have to be look like a mansion or look like a skyscraper. Right. But it does look good. This stuff really excites me to get to draw on, man. And I he, like seeing it. And you I, know what I like? Part there, of it, there's something real powerful about seeing it in this form. A part of it, too, is like... He's been at this for so long that there's so much confidence in all these lines... That he makes it look easy until you get to the board and you're like, oh no, this stuff, you got to draw for 70 years. 
There's to, a ton to of be these kinds good. of panels where that's not a particularly good hand, but it's a hand like it. It is in a way, you know, it's the right size. Everything's proportionate, but he's not laboring over any of it. It's just like dash, dash, dash. There are your fingers onto the next thing. Yeah. And there's a bunch of that stuff throughout this, which yes, once again, I, I you know, maybe 200,000 hours is, a, is an overestimate, but like he's got the time, like there's a hand on her face or there's this emotion that you're drawing. Like he could dash it out left-handed or, you know, half asleep <laughs> or whatever. And it would still read and communicate, you know, perfectly because like he's done it a million times. This weird, goofy ship we're now seeing in three different camera angles and three consecutive panels. Yeah, some of those Good are luck. really bizarre, like an insect kind of Yeah, ship. Dave Cockrum designs. Some, fun, some of the fun, you know, pencil drawing. Good luck, Terry, figure out how to interpret this. And he wouldn't just do it with that thin line. Many, mm -hmm. you know, these characters are being zapped somewhere else. We've seen them do that before. Maybe even that's a surprint or something. Yeah, Lelandra turns heel, man. This becomes uh, Carl Burke's The Golden Helmet uh, at, at this point. And The Golden Helmet is Phoenix. I wanted that to be real. I want that to be true. <laughs> I want to talk to John Byrne about that now. <laughs> Carl Barks. John, better than Alex Toad? <laughs> Carl who? <laughs> Was he an editor at DC in 1985? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's hard to imagine Byrne spending too much time reading comics with his output. Yeah, he just, you know, internalized all that stuff as a kid. There goes that Legion of Superheroes looking Shi'ar guy. And it's Lil, it's Lilandra Phoenix fucking up all of uh, the toughest dudes in the Shi'ar Empire as she makes her way down to Earth to the present day. Drawing these figures in this like weird perspective too. That that's just not e easy. But he's he's always been so good at that. Yeah, his figures are very dynamic. You know, you look at any of these spreads, even spreads that aren't necessarily like the big fight pa pages, and figures are twisting around, foreshortened. He knows the tricks. Yeah. How to keep each of these pages exciting. And the moment we've all been waiting for, the Phoenix hops into. The the five-year-old minded Jean Grey to bring back a very familiar, you know, version of that character. Stay tuned next issue. Once again, I want to say if uh, a third volume of this was produced, because I do think that there are at least six more issues that have been fully mm -hmm. done. And if it makes its way to the kayfabe offices, man, uh, what do you say, Jimmy? If this uh, if this hits twenty thousand, we got to take a look at that volume three if it exists. Yeah, I'll put a third volume on my shelf and in my in my brain. <laughs> it's a cool object to have, man. This this dude who made his bones in comics can do whatever he wants to. Swore off doing work for hire comics, so you got to come up with some kind of Byzantine weird deal to get him to, to do an X-Men comic for you, is just sitting at home. Man, I seen the uh, photos of his studio, and it's like he bought a strip mall, or like or like an office in like a strip mall. It's a big space. And just has all of his tchotchkes and stuff, the biggest drawing, drafting table money could buy, a complete, you know, in that office park or whatever it is, it's just all windows to that one side, so he's just looking all at nature and shit away from everybody, just sitting there making his X-Men comics, his fan fiction X-Men comics. Dojinshi. Dojinshi. Dude, it's Dojinshi. <laughs> Take this shit to comic -ed. Yeah, it's wild. I love it. This is some of my favorite kind of stuff, this sort of like fan fiction, you know, bootlegs, whatever you want to call it. I love it. And it's it's wild to me that somebody of John Byrne's caliber professionally is spending his time doing this. But you know, it's it's retirement, right? Like he's essentially retired and uh, you don't want to do nothing. It's the worst thing you can do in retirement, right? So Absolutely. what do you do with a lifetime of comics making? Go back in there, Fit, right or wrong. I'm saying like, like, I would read anybody's bootleg comic. Like the fact that you're just sitting there with no editorial or anything and you're just able to, without a safety net, like make some comics. And we're so we're seeing an untethered, unedited John Byrne he's very 
like happy with himself as a creator and stuff very confident in himself as a creator you know he's the next king of comics after a uh, after a uh, jack you know self professed so, yeah, i was going to say self proclaimed self professed king we'll, of comics after we'll the uh, letters columns in uh, next men where he <laughs> explains why he's the uh, the new king <laughs> uh so let's see what you look like without a tether without any editor and and we're seeing that it is fascinating too to think like you're essentially in a position where you've got a very high level of craft. You can do anything you want now because you're not doing work for hire. You're not even, you know, it's, it's bootleg. You can do anything you want. And X-Men is what he chooses to do out of anything in the world, something new, something in his mind, something the House of Marvel owns. Yeah, yeah. He said that like even when he, he created Alpha Flight, did Alpha Flight for like two years, and he said it, it felt weird. It felt like it felt like R.C. Cola heroes because it wasn't a part of like the traditions that that he grew up with you know this is a fanboy fanboy kind of guy man why not go back to the thing that made you made you most popular he was the dude waiting in the wings when dave cockrum was like i need to take a powder i need to tap out a bit and it was john Byrne who was like put me in coach put me in i'll draw this the the interesting other piece of this is the idea that like when he does the first phoenix saga Who are his readers, right? It feels like those would have been like some of the more mature readers at the time. That was pretty sophisticated comics for that era. And it's like that group has grown up with him. You know, it's not like these are going to... 13-year-olds aren't reading this. It's those fans from that era, from the Dark Phoenix. I read Dark Phoenix when I was a kid. It was after it was initially published, but it was still that same deal of like when I started getting into comics, that was stuff that was celebrated and stood out as superhero comics. And now here we are 30 years later and I'm reading his uh, his follow-ups. Well, here's the thing though. Like one of the things that I like about this uh, is that just projecting myself back to a time when I was a kid reading comics, this is like good, like... the first volume is closer to like Jim Shooter era, one and done. Mm-hmm. Every comic is somebody's first comic type comic, but it's a it's a nice reading experience for for like a, for for a boy for a kid. Like I would have totally yeah have eaten any of these comics up when I was a little kid. You know he's not he's not trying to get a, um you know an Eisner for best writer or something like this. Man, it's like it's like good pulpy kids comics it's definitely in that monthly mode yeah what's fascinating to me thinking about like a volume three is that this one is different than that first volume Mm -hmm. like i don't know if he's gotten more comfortable or ideas are in a different state or whatever it is it has a very very different reading experience and i wonder like what's that third one you know like is he continuing to evolve in some way as a storyteller and then is is volume three sort of like an apex where it's like okay i'm picking up where i left off but here's 30 years later of me and now like Here's the here's the you know the the real result of this. I've I've done a year's worth. Now watch out. Here's the thing though, like this as a reading experience felt like the load has been shot. Like this is the stuff where he's hitting the first of all the first six issues is where he's hitting the ground running and really putting in ideas that he's he's had swirling around in, in that head for a long, long time. This stuff it's more spread out. We're stretching one story across a bunch of issues. And and it didn't it didn't build to, you know like what's the climax the like, climax is Dark Phoenix right like yeah. this is the alternative story and it's set up the last page it's like uh, here we go okay this is what I this is a year of groundwork I see for the payoff maybe I don't know I you know it's it's this is wild stuff and without an editor to say hey don't do that or or tell that story in one issue I don't know what it is but it does feel like it's it's you, you get to see him sort of like evolving a little bit and I'm curious what is in that third volume. You know what, Jimmy? I'm curious, too. So one more time. <laughs> you know who you are. Uh, if there's a third volume, let's do lunch. Let's have a conversation. And uh, include two volumes in that package. Absolutely. You know, like, we'll figure all of that those details out. Uh, maybe we should even uh, try to make that happen. Let's get out of here, Jimmy. K favors, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. What do you have, man? Patreon.com slash Jim Rug, where you can download a dozen out-of-print zines and mini-comics. You can see my original art, scripts, and the process by which I make Street Angel, Deadly Girl Live, Plain Janes, Octobriana, and much more at Patreon.com slash Jim Rug. Red Room, the antisocial network, out on the stands now. The trade paperbacks are going fast, man. So if you see it, get your, your copy as ASAP. Red Room Trigger Warnings, issue number one in stores, December, mid-December, early to mid-December. 
Uh, what else? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. All right, Jimmy, given those margin orders, we're going to be on our way. Read more comics.